I'm Paul Amos, founder of The Redeemed, and I'm here today with a very special set of guests in a very unique environment for us. The Redeemed is an organization that's created a community of men who come together to help men through their most difficult times in life and their triumphs over those difficulties. And today we're gonna to talk about a significant topic in benevolence and talk about exactly what it means to overcome and some of the things that are difficult in people's lives. Today, I'm my partner in crime is Nate Dewberry, who's joined us as the director of The Redeemed. And we're here with two special guests in Rodney McClure and Lance Osborne, who I've known for most of my adult life uh, in a very different capacity. Uh, but we're here today to talk about One Need and the organization and what it brings to the community. And so, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, Paul. It's Thanks, good to be Paul. here. Guys, glad to have you. Exciting Thanks, to uh, hear your story about One Need, but also your personal story. And so thrilled to have you on the show today. Thanks. So we're going to start where we start with all of our guests. And y'all can, one of you take it or both of you can take it. But what does redemption mean to you? I'll take it. All uh, right. Or we can both take it. I you, definitely want to take some of it because I got something to say on the matter. Um, I, you know, watching your podcasts and the videos that you guys do, I've seen this question asked a lot. I've been asked it a lot. And so you give an answer and you start thinking, is that the right answer? Is it like, <laughs> do I even know what to yes. be redeemed means? Have yes. I really thought about this? And, um, you know, I have, I, I became a Christian late, like I was 33 years old. Um, and so there was, you know, some background there. And I remember early in my walk talking to a group of men at a very small church. Um, it wasn't because I was qualified to talk. They just were like, People get saved at 33. Like, this is great. You didn't grow up as a Christian. And so, um, but I went to one passage of scripture that I continue to go back to um, that brings me, it encourages me, but also gives me a lot of peace at times. Um, but it's when Paul, the Apostle Paul, is talking um, to the church of Ephesus, and it's in Ephesians 2. And it starts at, you know, verse 1 and goes to about 10. And I'm not going to read it exactly, but y'all can go read it. But it talks about how we were all dead in our trespasses. All of us were in sin and we were so far from God and then we were you know it talks about being uh, living in the lusts of our flesh it talks about um, all of our nature and how we were it calls us sons of the dark one or sons of the enemy or sons of Satan kind of thing and it's like all of us not just some of us all of us not the ones who did all the right things growing up and went to the youth groups but all of us were, were completely lost but what really gets me, and this is to me what it means to be redeemed, the next word is, in my opinion, the two most beautiful words um, of my life. And it says, but God. But God. Not but me, but God. So here I am, but God, and then I'm redeemed. And then it, it goes on to talk about the next four, three or four verses about what is, what is the purpose of a redemption and all of that. But for me, man, if anybody hasn't read um, Ephesians 2, just the first, it's all good, but it gets into other topic after that. But the first, like 1 to 10, and then in the middle there it says, but God. So for me, redemption means but God, being rich in mercy, lavish his love upon awesome. me and all of us uh, through his son Jesus to make us whole and redeem us to him. Love that, man. Great scripture, great passage, but such a simple but God. Right. Yeah, not a lot to add to that. I mean, I, I think that I've, I feel the same way about it. And it's, for me, I think it but God, but the God of the universe loved me enough to find a way through his son to, to, to reconcile me to him. Mm. Right. That love. Right. It's sonship. Yeah. Right. Adopted, fully heir uh, to God the Father. So when I think about redemption. I think about this big, huge God that created it all, and then I think about God the Father. One of my favorite things about asking that question every time is it. It is personal. You know, we we have our our different answers, but it it is the same theme that it's God that did something and. We get to share that story and, and hear other people share what God's done. And one of the things that's always special to me is watch how everybody shares it differently, but it's always related to their personal journey. Mm -hmm. And that's the cool thing about that he is a father, that it's that intimate relationship. It's not just something that's inanimate and, and 
and lifeless and no emotion. It, it involves every part of our being and transforming and changing us. And when we're adopted into that family, that understanding of redemption becomes real and personal for each of us, which yeah. is so cool. Yeah. Well, Nate, you mentioned personal story. And so let's jump there if yeah. we can. Um, just love to hear a little bit about your journey. Love to hear a little bit. I, I know a lot. Uh, and so don't try to cut any corners here, <laughs> gentlemen. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, give us the abridged version of, of a little bit of your story, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. Um, I was um, raised by a single mom, a couple brothers and sisters. She was a godly woman, loved the Lord with all her heart. Um, she had to deal with me and my brothers, uh, my brother and sister. Um, and... Uh, you know, went through high school like everybody else, went to college, dropped out of some really good schools that I probably shouldn't have been at any of them. Um, you know, found myself early in my career um, with kind of one option, really, um, jump into some kind of sales career because I didn't have a ton of education. I didn't have a ton of talent in other areas. I wasn't artistic. I wasn't anything else. And so, you know, I was working in a warehouse uh, for at Atlanta Binding and Graphics off Powers Ferry Road in 25 outside of Atlanta and um, didn't know where I was going to turn and it was getting hot in that warehouse, man. And I walked up front <laughs> and I asked the boss, man, I said, listen, man, you got anything else for me to do? He's like, can you make cold calls? And I was like, do I have to sit in the warehouse and do it or do I get to sit in this air conditioner? And uh, he said, no, you're going to do it right up here. I said, yeah, I'll do it. He walked me over to this cubicle and fired the guy in front of me and said, this is your desk. <laughs> need you to make 100 wow. calls a day, 100 calls a day or you're fired. And I was like, fine, I'm not going back there, not going hmm. back there. And so that's where it launched for me, um, my sales kind of career. Uh, ended up with a, a company selling uh, automated procurement software that was going public. We went public uh, and then we were bought and then everybody had to go home. But you had some options from there because we had a little bit of an exit, very little. I was 25 years old, newly married to my high school sweetheart, who I'm still married to today. Um, and, and I ran into an opportunity to, to work for, you know, as an independent contractor to be a salesman and sell benefits for a company called American Family Life Assurance Company of Columbus, which had just had the duck campaign come out and Aflac was, for me, um, uh, something that I thought was a great opportunity, and it turned out to be that. I spent the next 13 years or so kind of building my organization there. During that, um, I came to Christ in, in 2007 during that kind of time in my life of basically just being a sales guy trying to grow a team. So that's kind of my background work-wise, and I'm sure we'll get into other things about redemption as we talk. But just basically just a sales guy that if you'd have given me shoes or rebar, I'd have sold both. It's just a bunch of activity there for me. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's what I do. Well, Rodney, I have to know. You said you came to know Christ in 2007. What what spurred that that in your life? Was there a season of um, conflict, or was it just all of a sudden oh, you came to the realization that Christ was who He said He was? There was some conflict. <laughs> I think we can all um, we all know that. But no, nothing happened um, for about a year. I started um, having overwhelming bouts with depression and shame and guilt that weren't there before for me. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I never want to ever use any testimony to say, well, you're so bad. And then God, and he kind of grandizes, you know, in, the person in that way. I don't feel that way at all. Pretty normal. Yeah. Um, guy woke up, I woke up in the morning, I put a suit on you know, slammed the alarm clock, put a suit on, slugged my coffee, went to work, did my best, you know, came home, did my thing, and then just repeat. And, um, and then it wasn't cool anymore. It, I, I wasn't good anymore. I did not like who I saw in the mirror. Um, I remember distinctly one morning just looking in the mirror and being like, this is it? God, like, is this what this is? Like, in my mind, I was like, there's got to be more. I'm, not, I'm missing something. And I started to pray. And the only reason, and I, I, I'm so thankful for the people who sowed into my life with the gospel that never got to see the harvest. They didn't see any result. They probably said things to me like, that kid's never going to listen. He's never going to get it. Um, and so I take that with me now in our ministry for that reason, because how many times have I heard the gospel growing up? 
with my mom or, you know, being around other people mm. that I knew that were believers. Um, and then one day, my but God moment, yeah. um, just started working on my heart. It was a four day that I remember a four day ordeal. Um, I tried everything to get it off my mind. I, you know, tried to drink it away, tried to run it away, tried to work it away. I couldn't get this feeling, this pursuit feeling off my mind. Like I got to change my life. This is not, this is not acceptable anymore. And so the way I describe it is, um, I laid down on the end of my bed at four in the morning and I gave up Mm. and I, I counted the cost for about four or five days intently. I thought it had been brewing, but I counted the cost for, I mean, what I remember three, four, five, six days, something like that, where I was just kind of not, not very comfortable in my skin. And when I laid down, um, I was saved and I was saved because I laid down and I gave up my life um, to follow Jesus. And I did not know where that would take me. I certainly didn't think I'd be sitting here with Paul and Lance and <laughs> doing That's a awesome. podcast. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm very thankful that I am. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks yeah. for sharing your story so, and, yeah. and, and answering my, my question a little bit more about how you came to know Christ because everybody's story is different. Right. And uh, it's fun to hear yours. Lance, you jump on with uh, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, man. I grew up, you know, uh, with, with a family where mom was a Christian. Uh, went to church all the time. Um, I walked that aisle that, 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 that means something to those that grew up in, yeah. in yeah. rural churches. Uh, at 14, I had to go back and look up the date recently because I was curious about that. Um, so something happened, right, in a small rural. I wouldn't have done that yeah. uh, without some movement of the Spirit. Um, but... Very soon after that, probably 16 uh, till decades, right, I, I didn't get the rest of it. Um, this idea of repent and sanctification and, 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 and relationship, I just didn't get that. And so I was in and out of church for, for decades after that, never far away from it, but never far into it. And uh, really spent... Um, you know, those decades as God, right? I, I, could, I, I had a lot of idols, work, things, a lot of unwanted sin and behaviors uh, destroyed a lot. Um, and uh, in, after 30 years in, in business and some success, that didn't work anymore. And I took a sabbatical, going to find me. Uh, and in that in that process, I I, I found uh, I, f- I found a relationship mm-hmm. with Jesus in that. Wow. And uh, uh, it, I lost a lot um, in that journey, and I was pretty close to the end of the rope. And at the end of the rope is where Jesus was. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I reengaged uh, at that point uh, to try to find out not who my mother said he was, not who all those preachers said he was, not who my, my good friend said he was, mm-hmm. but I wanted to know for myself who he was. Right. Um, and things begin to change. Well, that's uh, cool to hear how in different journeys – same story of laying down surrender mm-hmm. um it's amazing how when we give up god does so much more than what we could ever think about uh we think surrender sounds bad especially for me and the last thing i want to do is surrender but when we surrender god does a, a amazing work in changing us you know as men we hear so many messages throughout our lives that are so counter to what god wants us to do You know, we we think about pride, we think about giving in, we think about all the things that we hear, man up. I mean, all the things that we're supposed to do, they're really counter to what God's looking for in a relationship. I don't know how it is for women, but for men, I feel like we've really got to change the message and flip the script a little bit about what's going on and teach our kids from the beginning 
how to grow up in a relationship with Christ as opposed to growing up in a relationship that the world tells them they're supposed to have. Yeah, man, I, I think that, that that's a, a, something that I have enjoyed on this journey the most is, is early during that process, I was able to engage in group work. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time in the last three years in, in group, uh, uh, both therapy and in, in Christian men groups. And it's a, when you go in and you begin to build relationships based on your weaknesses, not your strengths, you, you, that's, that's the relationship that we're looking for. But you're right, we try to go about it the wrong way. We think we can find commonality and camaraderie in our strengths. Yes. <laughs> and it's, it's, I'm not saying that that's not possible, uh, but it's really hard and it doesn't last long. Yes. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's possible, but not meaningful. Right. You know, you, you just don't have that depth of character. Women do a much better job than men of showing their vulnerability and then being empathetic with each other about that. I just had the opportunity to come back from a group that I was doing with seven other guys where we got vulnerable real quick and stayed that way for the weekend. And it's amazing. After three days, you feel like you've known somebody your whole life as opposed to 20 years of a male friendship where all we did was watch sports and never got a moment of depth in that relationship. Oh, I mean, a lot of us probably have been involved in other organizations other than the church that we were very vulnerable to those men in those groups and we have lifelong relationships and friendships as a result yeah. um, you think of teams societies clubs whatever it is um, and i remember you know thinking early on in christianity that you know the church should be this way we shouldn't wash our car and put our mask on to show up to <laughs> church we should probably show up and just lay it out there if we can um, and, and if it is a safe space to do that um, then we should we should be doing that, and so, you know, it's it, it to me having a ministry like the Redeem that's focusing on that and and more, and if that becomes a part of the the culture, um, it'll have a, an impact that's so great on the kingdom. I feel like yeah. because you're right, it's it, we're not told to do that. No, we're not. We're told to no. man up, like you know, slam the alarm clock, drink your coffee, make your sales call, or whatever that is, go run the marathon, whatever it is. It's always work, work, work. Um, and, to, and, and in our culture, it's praised. It's celebrated. Yeah. You know, I had the opportunity to live in Japan for two years. Mm. And while Shintoism and Buddhism are considered the religions of Japan, I really believe that work is the religion of Japan. Mm. Right. And I think that as men, we're taught that work is the priority in whatever form. And yet relationship is what God wants from us. And it's not the work or doing the works that he really desires for us to do. It's to build that one-on-one -on -one love, sonship, as Lance said earlier, you know, that really and truly develops us into a long-term son of God. Right. Yeah. So true. I think when we're looking at that and thinking about groups, we've just started a online group and a in-person group with the redeemed. And, you know, our heartbeat is to connect men to other men. And like you said, Lance, it's about connecting over vulnerability or, or weaknesses because oftentimes when, when men do that, it doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter their level in society or, you know, whatever considered. It doesn't matter where they come from. When they connect over there's those weaknesses, there's a bond that's there that's stronger than any of that. And there's, um, there's a willingness to fight for each other. And I think men need to know that somebody's standing with them, not just in – uh, in life, but it's spiritually that it's it's a bigger and, and more important relationship that I'm going to be willing to stand with somebody and beside somebody and know that somebody's got my back. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes, I think we know that it, in in certain areas of our life, but then other times you really feel like you're on your own. You know, <laughs> everybody's out to get you, and it depends on who gets to the top. And I've got to watch my back all the time. But when you share your weaknesses, people go, "Oh, I'm I understand that. I'm beside you in it." Yeah, and and I think. That, that happens in group, and I think, you know, what you guys are doing with your online and in-person group, man, I really applaud that, and I think if, if as that continues to grow, um, the redeem will continue to grow. It's, it's almost organically yeah. grown. But here's, a, here's what happens in groups that's really important that we really don't see out in the world, and that is what I call this gift of going first, mm. 
right? Somebody has to go first with their story and, and, and with their weakness. And you, you've recognized this in, in groups, right? When, when that happens, no right. when some, some, and, and it always happens, right? Somebody is, is ready to go and get it off their chest and say, I can't carry this anymore. And when they go first and, and it's safe, and they're not judged. They're loved. You know, your uh, one of your podcast guests, Trey Etheridge, I, I believe that's right uh, from Impact. You know, he had a he had a line that said, "When you surround yourself with men that are going to love you more because of your weaknesses, not love you less, you you, you recognize you're in a, in a good place." Yes. No, no doubt. Yeah, and I feel like just personally that the enemy. We forget it's a spiritual war that's happening. It's not just flesh and blood. It's principalities of darkness. It's, it's the good versus evil um, struggle. And the power of being vulnerable and sharing something that, that you're dealing with, a sin in your life, we'll use that as an example. Yeah. Um, the enemy does not want us to do that. No. <laughs> it definitely does it. You know, there's, once you shine light on something, like the light, yeah. It's just not as scary. It's like, I can't tell anybody about this. And you're like, well, but I did. So I, I've been discipled by a couple of people, but I'm currently discipled by the same person that God, I got to be in front of very early on in my walk. And it was you know, eight years before I shared something with them that meant anything because I was so scared. Mm. I was just mm. scared because that's where the enemy wanted me yeah. is scared. So I said it and he was like, oh yeah, me too. Yeah. I was like, wait a second. What do you mean? What do you mean you two? You've been a Christian like yeah. pretty much your whole life and you speak at these unbelievable places and you just said me too? I don't even know what to do with that. He's like, Yeah, if you shine light on it, it's just not that big a deal. And I'm like, You should have told me this earlier. He's like, I've been telling you that for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> You're just listening now, you know? And so I I'm with I echo Lance on that. Like, once you put the light in these corners of our lives and you see that other people have those same edges. And you can love them through, you know, love them on their edges, and they, they are understanding of yours. That's it's powerful, man. Yes. But this is the way of Jesus. That is, yeah. Right. This, this is this is the way of this is surrender. Right. I heard a quote the other day that, that Jesus didn't come here to die; he came here to live, and to show us how to. And he, it's a. But the way he died even was surrender. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's just such a powerful lesson, and it is so counterculture. Yes. <laughs> today. Right. More than ever. Uh, and, and those of us who are willing to do that and give this gift of going first, um, we, we get from that. Yeah. yeah, like you said, it's very countercultural today. I think it is all about my rights and what I deserve. And when you surrender to Christ, you realize that the God of the universe is protecting you and with you. So it, no matter what, no matter what you sacrifice, no matter what you give up, you win. And that is so freeing because you don't worry about when somebody offends you, you can let go of that. Because, you know, what good is it going to do me to hold an offense against somebody else? Or, you know, if there's a situation that somebody is um, completely wrongs you, you can let go of it. Yes. I mean, it's freeing. Yeah. Um, and, and listen, man, there's no, no, all hearts are open to God. He knows all, right? No secrets can hide, right? right. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and he chooses love, yeah. <laughs> right? It's truly amazing. I mean, you know, I got a pretty tough story. And to think about the fact that he chooses love with me is just blows me away. I can imagine if you're the Christian who's made all the right choices your whole life, you're thankful for God, but you don't really understand the same way that I do what forgiveness means and what redemption means. And that's not to knock to anybody else. It's just an appreciation for, man, the, the, the plethora of things that happened culminated in a very different life for the future. Yeah. And I, I think I share that, right? I share that from your story. I share that from my own story. And, but I don't think we bask in it enough. No. Right? I think we, we, we need to take this time to slow down and just meditate in that forgiveness and in that love. And it is 
it, 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 you, you, you become so overwhelmed with that love that you, you have to go out that day and love, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's easier to lead with love. Yeah. Well, you think about, there's a lot of examples in Scripture where, you know, you read them and you either think, you know, are, are you the woman at the well? Or are you the one who did everything right watching like the disciples being like, why, why did you even go through that town? I ain't yeah. supposed to do that, Jesus. Yeah. And then why are you going to the well in the middle of the day? Because no one does that. And then why are you talking to her? Mm-hmm. And that's Jesus talking, that's us. And I, I'm thankful that God and the Holy Spirit continues to make me remember that I'm, I'm, I'm the woman at the well. Mm-hmm. I'm, you know, the sinner that yep. needed saving. I'm so thankful for that, that, that for some reason, God has granted me the ability to not think, oh, you're the saint. You're the one who did everything right. You know, I'm not the, the prodigal son's brother. <clears throat> who's just like, wait a second, I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. You know, like that's a hard spot to be in too. You know what I mean? I have friends mm-hmm. who have grown up and in the church and like, you know, they played music and then their mm-hmm. dad was the preacher and their dad's dad was the preacher. And now, and these churches are enormous and everything's great and they've done everything right. And they sometimes have a hard time seeing themselves as, in my opinion, seeing themselves as the one, well, cause they'll share that with me and be like, what do you mean? Like, I don't feel like I've ever done anything that wrong. And that's hard to get your head around. I think sometimes, yes. um, if you haven't done anything that you think's that wrong. Yeah. Um, but the scripture in Ephesians two says we all, or sons of darkness, no. all of us, yeah. not the ones who it took longer, not the ones who had to go down and get, you know, waller in the mud a little bit, all of us. Mm-hmm. And then, but God, not, but us, you know, but God. And so sometimes I think it's two, two sides of the coin where you mm-hmm. can be like, man, I haven't done, I haven't, I don't really have a testimony. Yes, you do. Any redemption is an amazing yes. story, regardless of where yes. you come from. Um, if you came from, you know, hardship or not. Yeah, it's 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 really not where you came from. It's where where he, you are now. Yeah, well, yeah, where you are now. Yeah. Well, it's all about the glory of God. It's not about you know my story. Yes, our story is part of the testimony. It's part of the trans. But that story is meant to magnify Jesus. It's meant to tell of how good He's been to us. Yeah. And no matter whether it's growing up in church and having a great family life, or coming out of difficulty and sowing wild oats, it's you know it you get to magnify Jesus versus your own story, your own life. A truly transformational story really shines the light on Christ and magnifies the fact that a good God could love me and choose me and desire to have a relationship with me and could change me, transform me. Right. The prodigal son tells both those stories within one. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I met this uh, cowboy out in Texas and, uh, and he called himself a redeemed outlaw. Uh, he was a cowboy most of the week, and he, he was preaching on Sunday uh, at this local small church. And, uh, and he called it the Redeemed Outlaw Baptist Church. Right? <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 but to your point, Rodney, so, so when you hear that, you, we hear outlaw, and we think this, you know, super bad. No. What, what, to your point, man, we're all outlaws. Yeah. yeah. Until we're redeemed. Right? Exactly. Well, let's talk for a few minutes about one knee. Let's okay. shift into Rodney, the story of, you know, how you came to the idea, what one knee means, and, and honestly, a little bit about what it means to you. Uh, one knee is, is the outgrowth of my worship. Hmm. Um, I became a Christian as an adult, um, had a decent little business going and had some resources and also had some time. Uh, I was in a role that I didn't didn't take all day to do the job. Uh, You had to get guys going and then you were good to go. And so, you know, as a believer, I'd read, I started reading the Bible and it started coming pretty clear to me that if you have resources, you should look to help people in need. And I would think, well, I'm not rich. I mean, that's for rich people, right? And it's like, well, no, you are rich. Like, you're not as rich as other people you know, but you're compared to everybody else in the world. 
that's not on your block. You're, you got resources. And so I, you know, I was very um, nervous and very unsure of how to do it, but I knew I had to do it because I, I just, it was, it was an act of worship for me. Um, knowing who God is and what he did for me, I then had to go out and look for people to talk to about it. And I wasn't comfortable talking to anybody that was on my sales team. <laughs> Not one. Mm. I was scared of them. I, what am I going to say? They're going to ask me some question. I don't even know. Yeah. Half those guys have been reading the Bible longer than I have. And I don't, I don't there's no way. So I, don't, I, if I, I couldn't pick the day. But what I did was I started, um, it, it seemed to be on Tuesdays. We do like a Monday morning sales meeting. And the Tuesdays weren't as busy. And I would drive around. I had these cards made up with my name and phone number on them. And I would drive around the area that my office was. And, and at the time I had, you know, there was these other offices that reported to me. So I would end up in different parts of town all the time. Um, and I would drive around looking for people in need. I know that sounds crazy. Hands trembling, mouth shuddering, scared, looking for people in need. I would go into areas that I normally wouldn't go, uh, looking for people at warehouses on their smoke breaks, just anything I could do. And... Uh, I, would play, I would play music. Sometimes it was Christian music. Sometimes it was just music to calm me down. Uh, and then I would just try to be brave and I would walk out and hand them a card and say, hey, my name's Rodney. Um, I don't know if you have a need or not, but I feel like God led me here to, to talk to you. And they would look at me like I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I was fine being crazy because I was, to be honest, I was kind of crazy. And there's a level of craziness yeah. in there. Like, you believe this? I'm like, yeah, I believe this. And so when I would do that, I, I just, you know, God, God would give me opportunities. You know, one, one of the opportunities that's my favorite was a guy was on a smoke break. I gave him the card. He looked at me like I was crazy. Um, and he's a nice guy, though. And, he, and then he called me later. And he said, hey, man, uh, you came up and talked to me. I said, yeah. He said, I've been a horrible father. I mean, a horrible father. I, I'm just going to be, I'm going to shoot straight with you. I don't work enough. I don't save enough. I spend my money other places. And my daughter's got prom. I haven't really been in her life. And she hates me. Um, we were able to put a need together on that. And, and she got like, people rallied around her and got like a dress, a car, nails, hair. That's all awesome. Of that. And it all came from her father. Now, I don't know. I didn't. I don't see any harvest there, right? That was just a sow. We were just, God, you told me to go out, and so I went out. And here they were. I have no idea what happened to him or his daughter. Not. A, couldn't tell you his name. But that story of being able to have some kind of impact got exciting for me, and so I just, it just started building, and 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 really quickly, early on, grabbed uh, Brian Watkins and Jesse Horn, both very good friends of mine. And uh, they had the same passion to help people in need uh, and wanted to encourage others to do the same. And so they joined, we all joined forces and, and uh, named it One Need. We just came up with a name and, you know, put a web, stood a website up. And by July 2010, we were uh, pushing needs through the system instead of that card, me driving around like a crazy man. We had an actual system to use. And so... How did you come up? How did you come up with the name One Need? Was it was it truly random, or was there something that spurred that? Um, at that time, I was I was still trying to wrestle with salvation versus works. Uh, I still wrestle with it, mm -hmm. if I'm honest. Um, and but I don't wrestle with, you know, for me, it's 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 faith alone, faith. You know, even before Jesus was accredited as righteousness, right. now faith in Jesus is how you're redeemed. Um, so, so I've had balance with the works, but there is a works that has to be, there's some, they have a role to play. Why God chose us, I have no idea. I, we're very imperfect vessels. Right. Um, but for some reason, God chooses us to do that. And so I wanted, I wanted everybody to know that in reality, they have one real need. The, the, the Bible says, don't worry about this stuff. Worry about the stuff that can, yeah. that can put you in hell forever. Yeah. Worry about that stuff. This stuff is going to seem so big to you right now, but this stuff is what's really important. Scripture's over and over and over telling us that, hey, the world wants you to look over here. I want you to look over here. Mm -hmm. You're looking over here. Get your eyes back over here. And so one need, um, 
the name, the reason we named it One Need is that we all have one need, and that is saving faith in Jesus Christ. And there's no other need that's greater than that. Paying mortgages, car payments, tuitions, whatever, not saving any souls. Jesus and, you know, Jesus is faith in Christ is what it saves us. Yeah. And that's our one true need. That's why we call it one need. The mistake that we run into and that some marketing agency probably would have hated us for our name. They think you can only do it once. Oh, I already used one need one time. I can't use them again. That's not <laughs> how it works. But, uh, so that's where the name came from. Love it. Thanks for sharing that about the name. And gosh, what a great reminder. Every time you see uh, any branding or anything about your organization to remind you of what's most important. From 100 calls a day with no fear, as long as you got air conditioning, right. to a complete fear of doing it for God. I can speak to that. Because yeah. I got to tell you, man, going from the job that I had to the, to the ministry that I have now, mm -hmm. there is no doubt the enemy is speaking fear to me all the time yep. about the fact that I'm not worthy and I'm not, my faith journey is not long enough and I don't have the skills that it takes to go out and speak to people. Uh, and so I can feel you on what that was like and what that, right. the differentiation between those two. And yet you overcame it. That's amazing. Yeah, well, overcame the starting part. <laughs> um, I tell people all the time when, when I'm in these situations that the only thing that I know that I've done right is not quit. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I have no idea how all this works out. I have no idea how it's going to go. I can't see around any corners. I bet, Paul, in your life and business, there were times where you were in such a flow state of business that you felt like you could see around some corners, like that's what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And you could make moves to make you get to where you got to get to. I've never felt that way in ministry. I know most people that they're after God's heart in their ministry. They're not going to see around those corners because that's not what God wants us to do. No. Um, and so you're not going to be able to see around them. Um, and, and, and in that is the freedom to just not quit, to persevere, to just keep plugging along um, through the fear um, because it's not going anywhere. But, yeah, and, and it's, it's, you don't see around the corners, and you, at some point you stop trying to see around the corners. Yeah, that's right. right? <laughs> and, 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 and because, because God's been so good. But, and, but in, in hindsight, you can start to see these milestones, yeah. right? Yeah. These things that happen in the life of one need. And, and, and one big change was, was really focusing all the needs that, that come to one need through the local church. Uh, Rodney and, and, and were doing a great job in finding needs and meeting needs. But once the need was met, there wasn't another way to, to stay connected to that person or to create community or to have some more influence to get them to that true one need, mm -hmm. this yeah. saving grace of Christ. Yeah. And so they made the decision that they would only work through the local church because we believe that that is God's plan yes. uh, for the local church. And so today, um, all the needs that we meet are come through a local church partner. Uh, and we partner with that local church. Someone goes to ask that local church for help, mainly financial help. Uh, if they're a church partner of ours, that comes to one need. Uh, and then our ministry takes over because the ministry is to make sure that that person that calls on the church is fully heard, fully felt heard, uh, fully loved. And we may or may not meet their need, but we want them to be fully heard. Uh, and that's, that's where Rodney spends all of his time or most of his time, I'll let him answer that, um, no, yeah. is, is making sure that those people are, are fully felt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's where I spend, well, to, to, um, to Paul's point on when you're starting something out and how scared you can feel, um, that's the tool of the enemy. And so for me, um, I, I can barely, I have, like I said in the beginning, I don't have a lot of talent in that. I mean, don't ask me to balance your checkbook. Don't ask me to figure out technology. Don't ask, put a phone in front of me and tell me to dial it 100 times and ask people to buy something. I'll probably do that. That's all I've really done. And then you learn a little bit along the way about how to recruit and train and do certain things. But almost not, I mean, it's all transferable, but almost not none of it in the way that you think it will be transferable in your ministry. <laughs> you'll take it with you and you'll think, oh, I'm going to use it this way. And God will be like, no, no, you, you don't get it. <laughs> That was for this, and that was, and these pieces start coming together. That if someone asks you to write a book on, yeah. you can't, 
because you didn't do any of it. Mm -hmm. You just didn't quit. You just kept doing the next thing in that fear. And hopefully what's happened for me over the years is that fear has been overcome by faith, Mm -hmm. faith that God, just all the examples, all the things that you see, not saying I still don't get up at four in the morning on the dot almost every day, worried about something that I have to then put back to bed and say, God, you're going to have to do this because I can't. And I wish this would go away for me. I'm not sure that he doesn't, he doesn't want that four o'clock wake up call to remind me no matter what's happening, you got to rely on me. But, mm-hmm. but having those fears, they, you know, like, like Paul said, you can have one so much confidence in one area and then one area be like, man, what, how, why is this so powerful? Cause it's real. And the enemy does have power, yeah. just not ultimate power. Yeah. Right. Lance, I love that you talked about partnering with the local church and, and how important that is to connect that person to a, a community. And that's so healthy because one of the things we want to do, and and I, I hope every you know parachurch ministry wants to do, is connect people to the local church because we believe it is you know and the Christ bride, and it's important. And so for us, we just want to be that stepping stone. We want to be that partner in the process as you guys are, and so thankful for that um, desire and that heartbeat that you have to partner with a local church. And how do you build that relationship? with pastors, with the community and help them feel like you're supporting them and not competing with them? (laughs) Yeah, I I think it's, um, I I think the, I have not spent time with any local church who didn't have a big heart for benevolence. Um, And sometimes they say, we don't think we should be outsourcing this to one need. Mm -hmm. And we quickly remind them that you're not, right? We're coming in as a partner. We're coming alongside you in this benevolence part and process. Um, and you may, we may have some responsibilities, but we all have the responsibility to care, right? So this is not crowdfunding. This is crowd caring. Uh, that's so good. It's, like it's the big C church and a reminder that we're all part of the kingdom. And I think that's something that I love with Parachurch Ministries is helping people see that it's not just that local body. Yes, super important, but it is the global church and caring and meeting needs. And I think in some ways, the global church together is probably, and I think in some ways more healthier than it's ever been, because I think Mm -hmm. people are willing to partner. Uh, In the past, I've seen a lot more, um, hey, I'm going to draw my line here. Don't get, don't get with my, don't get around my flock. <laughs> I'm going right. to put a guard up. But I think there is a willingness uh, to, to work. And sometimes that's out of difficulty that some churches have faced. But I, I do think there's that willingness now to partner, which is so powerful for the kingdom. I, I agree. And I think, I think a, a really good way to measure the work that God is doing in a local church, name the church, is how many ministries are pouring out of that church that aren't that church's, so to speak, yes. ministry. So use, I'll use one new example. I have no other example. Um, come to Christ, get discipled, walk into a church, um, Canton, First Canton Baptist Church, walk into George Anderson's office and say, I got saved, what do I do now? Come back Sunday. That's what he said. (laughs) He said, said, I've got to go, but I do want to talk to you. And like, you know, Veda, I think was his his assistant's name. Wonderful people. Um, And so first works happened, right? Like my wife and I ended up getting baptized on the same day in the same water um, by the same pastor. And, um, you know, these things happened. And then as as my... um, sanctification was happening and my disciple being discipled was happening. A ministry was born that I can't tell how it was born. I don't know. It was just a desire, a, like a worship response to the mm-hmm. reality of who God is in our lives. That is from the church. That's mm. not, that's not something Sorry. I came up with without the church. I don't know where to go unless I had the church. Where do I turn to? And so you know, now today I go to a church called Oak Leaf Church and the pa- our pastor and my pastor's name is Tony Nolan. And one need, is it birthed out of Oak Leaf? I don't know. It's birthed out of the church. <laughs> and so when someone comes and asks, um, 
What's the local church here in, in, in the Columbus area? Church of the Highlands. Church of the Highlands. When someone goes and asks Church of the Highlands to pay their mortgage, who do you think they think they're asking? Individuals. They're asking God. Yeah. Right. Why didn't they go to Chili's yeah. and ask them? I know this seems silly. Why didn't they walk into Walmart? Walmart's got a lot of money, right? Like they're, they're calling on the church yeah. to help them in their time of need. Mm -hmm. And so it's impossible for the redeemed or one need or any other ministry to, to be. I, I, would, I would argue that none of them are parachurch. They're all part of the church. They came out of the church. And so just because organizationally you're not set up with like, you know, some kind of joint account or some branding that goes along, it's the church. We all have home churches. So the redeemed is born out of what? A, a church. The one needs born out of a church. And so... So I think sometimes we feel like they're not related and it, it's become part of the culture. And, and like you were saying, Nate, it's become more acceptable and yeah. more acceptable now. Um, but I, I think that was something we've done in our past as local churches is, and we've missed it a little bit by thinking that this isn't something that spawned, or, you know, not this, but all the ministries aren't something that spawned out of a church originally. You know, though, there is a big portion of our audience that whether it's shame, whether it's church hurt, whether it's fear, that they are nervous about the church. And that I ultimately believe that part of the reason that we formed the redeemed was a bridge to the church, was helping people understand that they need to get there, but they may not be ready for that. You know, I know for several people that I've talked to, it, the church is something that they grew up in, but they somehow were really hurt and harmed by their faith walk and what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, you know, we got to bridge that back because those are people, not God. Most often mm -hmm. that you see that happen in the church itself, it is the flawed human beings that we all are that we ultimately need to get them back focused on Jesus and on God to ultimately drive them to a place of their salvation and their understanding of what the church really is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think we, we have this idea of when, when, when we say church, we think about a church, a, a building. Maybe even it's the people that go to that building, but we think about it. In fact, we have to have a, we have to clarify when we're talking about the big C church. We have a way to describe right. it, right? It's either that or it's an event. Yeah, it's a it, church. it's the big C church, and that's what you really you know I love about One Need is that it it is the big C church. When when we when we find a need that that needs to be met, we send out a what we call a need alert. It's a it's a short story, uh, fact based, anonymous, to a network of people that's grown to seven thousand over seven thousand people now, who have registered to get our email. Uh, to get this story, we send it to them, uh, and we ask them to pray about it, to share it with others, and if they feel led to give. That's the church. Mm -hmm. and, and we love, I love interrupting these people in the middle of their busy, sometimes <laughs> self-absorbed day. I love getting interrupted in my self-absorbed, yeah, busy day. With this opportunity <laughs> to love their neighbor yeah. uh, and... And they do, right? Our needs are met within hours. You mentioned kind of how that the need comes to you. Can you tell us a little bit more about that process and how you find out about those and how a church partners with you and how individuals can sign up to even be involved in, in giving? Yeah, a church, a church that becomes a partner of ours finds out about one need through either our efforts or word of mouth or however, right? And, and we do an exploratory discovery meeting uh, with that to find out where, where and if and when uh, they should really partner mm -hmm. with, with one need. Uh, once that happens, we, we walk through a process that basically puts a, correct me if I'm language is wrong here, Rodney, but we put a, a quick web page on, usually on their site and whether somebody goes to their site looking for financial help or goes in the door, somebody's going to guide them there. We ask them two questions. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about your need. Uh, and then that goes to Rodney and his team. Uh, and we, we, um, when, a, when a need is submitted through the local church, someone asks the local church for help, they submit their need. 
if it's between the hours of nine and four during the week, they get an immediate phone call back from us, from our care pastor team. Um, and that care pastor that's talking to them has absolutely nothing else to do but talk to them. There's no meetings. There's no other responsibilities, nothing. They were probably reading and studying, waiting for them to put a need in. We have a culture of the care pastors that we devote at least 25% of our working or ministry time to study. We reserve the right, as Lance has said, to get better. And, um, and if we're not prepared when that need comes in, or if we have another meeting, then we, we're not, we're not going to be able to, like Lance talks a lot about, fully hear them, but also make sure they feel fully heard. And I know you guys have all done this before and had this done to you. Someone might hear you, but you don't feel heard. Yeah. Like, I know what you want now. And they just move on and you're like, oh, Lord, okay. <laughs> yeah. Did I say it? I'm gonna, no, I'll text them now. And so let's text them. And then you text to clarify. And then they sent back a little quick response. You're like, they're just still not hearing me. Yeah. I think, so we want them to feel fully heard because when they come and ask the church for help, they submit that need because we're ready for them. We're prepared for you. Mm. We've prepared a way for you. We're, we've put an environment together that is a place for you to submit your need 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a spot where just making one right move can make you feel great. I mean, I made my bed today or whatever it is. I've been there where it's like, man, just one, one. move right. And so putting that need in is the first step and then getting a really quick response in, a, in, the, in the way of a phone call is so encouraging. They're like, wait, I just put that need in. Yeah, we were waiting on you. You were waiting on me to ask you to pay my mortgage? Yes, we were. And so that's, that's the power of partnering mm. is that in today's church, not today's, but every church from all generations, there's a lot to do. There's sermons to prepare. There's funerals and weddings and counseling and name it. Just keep naming and all Sunday the comes, things. Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. <laughs> right. And so to dedicate, to have someone sit in a office at, at a local church and say, I'm waiting for someone to ask for a need so that we can be ready for them. That's kind of hard to do. And that's the ministry. And that's the ministry. Of one need, right? Now, every, and then that this conversation happens. It's long. It's, it's maybe a couple of days uh, sometimes, right? Go find out this, come back, right? But, but it's uninterrupted and we take as long as it takes. Now, not every need that is submitted gets alerted. Um, we say no. A lot. No to money. Right. Yeah, no to the financial ask, right? So, because money may not be the right, right. way to love right. that neighbor at that point. And so they go through that process. If, if we say no, and when we say no, we say no with hope uh, and some resources. And, and when we say yes, um, again, we fill out that, we complete that need alert. And then that goes to that group of 7,000, over 7,000. We call them deeders. Uh, and, and you'll have to explain that term because <laughs> nobody listening knows what that one is. <laughs> we came up, we made that one up. Yeah, we're just marketing geniuses. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a deeder in 1 John three sixteen through 18. John challenges us to love, not just in word and in tongue, but in truth and in deed. And he uses very pastor-driven languages there. He's like little children, like, hey, listen to me. Um, and we were reading that one day. We like to read the Bible at one eat a lot. And so we were reading that, and it was like, let's call them deeders. <laughs> Stupidest thing in the world. Um, <laughs> It's stuck. You know, we've even gone years back and forth. Like, should we even just drop it? And then someone will say, no, nah, keep it. It's funny. So we call people who get our need alerts, which is an email, formatted. We don't, we don't send you anything else. Um, and it's just a story where you can click. And we ask the deeders to do three things. When you get a need alert that's, that's come into a local church, that will be sent back to a local church, that's been fully heard and understood by qualified care pastors that frankly, don't want to do anything else and don't have anything else to do. We ask you to pray, stop what you're doing. So if you're whatever that job is, be interruptible and stop and pray for something else and someone else. Pray for the person that's dealing with the need. 
Please pray for us in the local church dealing with the person that has the need. Please pray for every person that's getting this need alert that they'll do the same. Encourage others to do the same. And then share, meaning advocate for that person. If you can tell someone about this need, forward it. Share it on your social media. You know, I always joked, I, it should be, you know, my, my social media feed should be filled with, you know, movies I like, stuff of my kids, the fact that I'm glad Matt Ryan's a, uh, at the Colts. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then uh, no, I'm just kidding, Matt. I'm just kidding. Um, hope he's okay. He got hurt this weekend. The, um, you know, and then maybe advocate for somebody that needs something. And so it should be a mix of what our lives normally look like. And it shouldn't be some campaign. It can be yeah. a daily thing we do between Sundays. And then click, one click, to give. And when you give, um, it's 100% tax deductible. And, and all of that money, less the PayPal fees and stuff, um, goes straight to the person in need. We don't run it through our operation. That We have no motivation to send out a need alert or not. It either goes out and that money is, is, is aggregated and then sent to the local church so that they can go meet the need and then pull them back into that community. Because it, it creates a tremendous amount of receptivity when you've taken that sense of urgency away from that person. Yes. And so now there's this open opportunity for invitation. And that may not be an invitation into the gospel. It may be an invitation to Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it right. more likely will be yeah. an invitation to Wednesday night. Right. You know, yeah. and yep. that will lead to the gospel. So, yep. so you know, this, this theater network... Um, these our needs are met really. I think I said this before, but but very quickly. I mean, it's a it's it's a it surprises me sometimes uh, how quick uh, the need would be met, and, and I think that's because believers and non-believers we 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 have we're generous. We're all built in the image of God. We 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 want to be generous. Um, unfortunately, um, there's another. Th Thing that happens really quickly after wanting to be generous. There's this other, I don't know if it's an emotion or not, but it's, it's skepticism, skepticism, right? Will they use the money the right way? Mm. Should I give it? Is their story real? Is it? And what happens with, with the one need is you don't have to be skeptical. You know it came from a local church. You know we've spent time with them. We know we fully heard it. And you know that the money's going to go, 100% of the money's going to go back to them. So our needs are met really, really quickly. It's, it's, when I first got involved, I thought this is, we're helping these people in need. That's the best part of one need. And then I said, no, <laughs> it's, it's what we're doing for the local church. We're really allowing the local church to be the local church. They can pick that megaphone back up and say, hey, come ye, right? Because they have us full time behind them, mm -hmm. setting, waiting to be interrupted. Today, the most fun part is interrupting <laughs> these people with the opportunity to love their neighbor because at our heart, we want to be generous. Awesome. Yeah. There's recent studies that show this, some of the same dopamine hit that you get when you see a big, good, nice piece of chocolate cake is, a, is the same one as, as when you help somebody. Mm -hmm. There's a dopamine release that happens. I believe that's in the image of God, right? So I'm curious, Rodney, after doing this for over a decade, huh. how have you seen the needs evolve if they have? The types of requests that may be different in the world today that when the world is ever changing right. than they might have been 10 plus years ago, or do you find that it's pretty much consistent? The, pan the coronavirus pandemic changed a lot of the needs, um, but let's take that out. Um, for this discussion, because that that was something unique. You know, running a benevolent system through a pandemic is something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, let's leave that out for now. But but the here's the the needs that I think what has changed more than the needs is is me and my heart for. Because you see it enough and you start, there's, it's going to go one of two ways, right? It's going to get hard in you and you're going to be like, oh, I already know it's going to happen, you know, it's, and not think that it's a new coin flip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that same conversation, that, that need that comes in that looks the same is not the same. You think it's the same. It's not. But then it, it is the same. Ten straight times. And you think the 11th time, there's no way. And then it's not the same. Uh -huh. So one of the things that I think we've gotten better at over the years is is 
taking all of our hunches and experiences and not leading them to assumptions. We just have to listen to this one, you know, like they've run the ball six straight times, but the next one could be a play action. So you have to be ready for that. And so that's, that's one of the biggest areas I think we've grown in, but, but the one, the, 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 the needs have remained the same. They haven't changed a lot. The economy doesn't seem to have a big factor in it. Um, the, the ones we see most, um, and this is not a stance on society. I don't care to make that. Mm-hmm. But when, when women, when single moms are dealing with employment is colliding with child care, it's, there's a lot of needs. I was raised by a single mom. She was a hairdresser. And if I got sick before the age that I could stay home alone, I would sleep in the break room at the hair salon because mom was going to work or we wouldn't have a house. Yeah. And she was like, we're going, Rod. Like, there's no way around that. So you can go to school. I don't want you to be sick. And that was back when we used to send kids to school sick. Um, <laughs> or you can go stay in the break room. And I remember it distinctly. It was an old Fanta machine that I could, like, reach my hand in there and steal, steal uh, drinks from. And a little couch and, and I was going to work, but that was an instance of employment providing colliding with childcare. What's more important. And so we see that a lot. I would say that that's, that's not changed a bit. Um, We, we also uh, see a lot of, and and it hasn't changed is all people not putting going to work on a high enough priority level. Like, like I didn't go to work for a month because, and I'm like, you didn't go to work for a month because, and you have to like coach them in and say, Hey man, you have to, like, things are going to start falling on you pretty quickly. If you can't find a way to get to work, like, you know, I had car trouble. So I didn't go to work for three weeks. I was like, man, you got to Uber. Well, I know it's been all my paycheck. I know, but you got to keep your job. Right. So like those commonalities yeah. where they, the need could have been fixed with a, a, a different decision six weeks ago, six months ago, whatever it could have been. That's the commonality with all the needs. Um, I have seen no trends either way. Take out the pandemic. I've seen no trends. Um, they all seem to be the same over the last 12 years or so. Um, but, but the biggest thing is that every need, almost every need, was because of a decision that was made, either repeatedly or a one-time. Very few, there are, they do exist, um, are victim situations. So the most common victim situation is is abuse, like domestic violence. We deal with those all day, every day, it seems like. Um, The other ones are no-fault accident, where like someone just hits you so hard from, uh, you know, you didn't do anything. You're just sitting there and you got hit and now you're like, how am I going to get to work? All those things. Those are, those are there, but the common ones are sometimes we've done some, we've made a decision that put us in this spot. And so over the years, we've learned that if we're going to make an error on helping someone or not, we're going to err on mercy. We're not going to err on accountability mm-hmm. because there's tons of reasons. Like Lance was saying, skepticism can pop yeah. up and you're like, well, you got here because you made that decision. It's like, well, thank God that he didn't leave me in the ditch when I made that decision. Yeah. Right. Like I, just because we had a different starting spot or a good guidance or maybe I made a different decision doesn't mean that I wouldn't deserve the help. And so when we talk to the dealers, we don't try to say, hey, here's how they got here. We say, all right, they're here now. We think this this help will help them. And we're going to continue to plug them into the local church so we can help change those behaviors if it is indeed yeah. something like that. Um, but I would say, you know, 90%, we've kind of come up with a number. It's round uh, for sure. It's a roundabout number. But 90% of the, the needs that come in, they're fully heard, and we decide that we should not apply money to them. There's some other thing that needs to happen, meaning resources, here's what you, know, you need to do, that kind of thing. Of those 10%, I would say 90%, 80 to 90% are some decision that was made that we don't want them to make again, but we're going to help them. Mm-hmm. And then 10% is total victim. Yeah. Like I walked in the house, and my husband like, punched me between yeah. the nose, and now I've got to leave or I'm, I'm scared and the kids are coming with me. Everything's in the trunk. We're out of here. Those are less often. So we got to err on the side of, 
Over the years, we've learned, err on the side of mercy, man. Just err on the side of mercy. Scripture tells us that. Yeah. You're not going to miss one err on the side of mercy, but man, you can miss some err on the side of accountability in a That's hurry. Right. Yeah, I think the other thing that, that, that we're, we're good at is through these conversations, and if it is a, a need that, that, that needs to be met, a lot of times they're asking for the basic. Right, I just need to get out of this this situation. But but Rodney and his group are so good at, at at probing and asking these questions. But what about this? And 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 what about this? And maybe even give them some homework. Go find out exactly what it's going to be. And then we're able to not just get them out of the situation. We're able to bless them, because as Rodney reminds me often, God's not short on cash. <laughs> right? Bono uh, said that originally. I think. You yeah, choose lead singer. I, I'm I'm giving it to you. I know. <laughs> I love that because I, I, I remember a, a missionary I've worked with that he said God doesn't need your stinking money <laughs> that yeah. you know it's, right. it's all, he has everything he needs and I think kind of that same principle that it's limitless. Well, what, yeah, and what I mean by that is when I hear people say things all the time, my friends that aren't Christians, my friends that, um, and really just the general media would say that Christians and Christian men and Christian women are a bunch of things. And they're not always very positive. Yeah. Um, they'll say things about the church that aren't positive. Um, my instinct is don't tell me that because now we're going to have to talk about it because you, you don't insult the church without me defending the church. You don't insult a Christian brother or sister of mine, whether I know him or not, and I don't defend them because we're going to talk about it. And you explain to me exactly what you mean, because the Christians I see, I send out a need alert for someone in need and they meet the need inside of a couple hours. Those are the Christians I see. The churches I work with are, are pastors and, that have dedicated their entire lives and they could do a hundred other things really well. They're not like me that aren't talented. These guys and, 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 and gals are crazy talented and they choose to do this to help people in need and, and to meet spiritual needs and to provide a community for believers. That's the church I see. And so when I say God's not short on cash, I mean the church is willing to, the, the people of the church will give it up. They don't try to hold on to it. Yeah. Wow. They'll just give it up. They're like, hey, this is all, I mean, read Acts. I mean, it's just like, hey, it's just, we're just gonna, let's go. Like, it's all ours, let's, let's roll. And that, I see that all the time. So when I see someone, a scandal break out or something at a church, or someone says something, like, okay, let's talk about all the good. Let's talk about all the good. And then let's weigh it. Let's weigh it against that, that major screw up. Let's, let's talk about that. And so when I think God's not short on cash, I mean that holistically. Like yeah. God's not short on any resource because the church is so generous and so giving and so caring. And I, I'm blessed to get to see that every day. Hmm. All right. So I think our audience loves the fact that we get to know the people on our show. So maybe we could do a couple of rapid fire questions. Nate, Nate and I will unfair. go back this, this and is forth. Unfair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. we so we'll let Nate and I go back and forth, and then uh, ask each of you guys to to answer. Simple. Start with this. What are you reading right now? Uh, I'm rereading Supernatural by um, Michael Heiser, Heisner, Heiser, and I, uh, Mere Christianity. Um. But one of my favorite books recently, like, is um, Malcolm Gladwell's Bomber Mafia. It's not a you know a, a super spiritual book, but it is. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, God has a name, uh, Comer. Oh yeah. Favorite favorite vacation spot. Mountains. Beach. I love that diversity. Good to have <laughs> yeah. within a company because unless you're going to Lake Tahoe, those yeah. are two very different things, right? <laughs> Favorite food? Pizza. Barbecue. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Wait, wait a minute. Te <laughs> Texas barbecue, <laughs> which will get me in a lot of trouble around here. Dogs. When you get away, what is vacation to you? Me and my wife without an agenda. Friends, family, um, beach, and no clock. 
favorite pastime? Cooking slash clanging and banging the weights, I think, probably. Uh, I have two girls, 15 and 12, and I love to just sit and spend time with them. Thank you. So generous of your time to sit here with us today, to have this in-depth conversation. If it's okay with you guys, before we completely shut it off, I'm going to ask Nate to pray for us yeah. and to pray for our audience and to kind of close us out, and then we'll come back and, uh, and end the show. Beautiful. Let's pray. Father God, we are so in awe of your love for us. I thank you for what Lance has taught me about being still, listening, pausing and reflecting on all that you've done for us. I thank you for Rodney and Lance and their entire team and how you're using them to be your hands and feet. I thank you for the message that they're part of the church, not a separate entity from the church. And I thank you for just how you're uh, helping people with great needs. Pray you continue to expand their influence and their ability to serve the kingdom. And we pray for all those needs that they're going to meet, Lord, that you would continue to help the church to be open, generous, and help each of us as we look and reflect on what you've done in our life to to. Make it about the most important need. I pray that we would be quick to share, quick to share what you've done in our life and how you changed us and how you transformed us. You're giving us a hope and a future. And I thank you for these men and their stories. And I pray your protection over them and their families. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. To our audience, thank you so much for your dedication. Thank you for the time you've spent with us today. We encourage all of you to sign up on our website to continue to get our emails. Look for us on social media. Uh, but most of all, during this special season of Christmas, we ask you uh, to think about and those around you and continue to love your neighbor uh, and love those people with you. Uh, God bless, Godspeed, and good night.